welcome to My Victory Church, one church in five locations. So let's welcome everyone that's joining us this morning in Tabor, Claire's home, Okotoks, Lloyd Minster, Lethbridge. Welcome, everyone. Welcome all of you that are watching online, wherever you are around the world, special welcome to you. We're glad you came, and if this is your first time, if you haven't been here for uh, any one of these series, uh, these messages on, on Seven, which is our first series in this church um, on, on the book of Revelation, yes, you're at the end of the movie, and I'm going to do my best in, in this message to catch you up, and, and we'll kind of sum it all up uh, at the end of what this whole series is all about. Before we do that, though, uh, this is the end of this series, and next week we're starting a brand new series called uh, Help My Marriage is in Trouble. Got really quiet in here. Uh, um, <laughs> we actually, this is the first time we're doing a series like this. We, we've done lots of marriage series, lots of relationship series, but this is the first time we've done a series like this. And what we did, um, do you guys, how many remember pre-COVID? Doesn't that seem like a long time ago? In February, pre-COVID, um, we did a series called This Is Us. Anybody remember that one? And in that series, we, we surveyed all of you and said, okay, what would you like us to take on um, as far as relationship? What questions do you have about relationships and, and marriages and, and, and all of that? And the questions we got back were very raw very real and, and and enlightening. In many ways, there's questions that came back that kind of made us think and look at things. So we're doing an entire series, a three-week series on the, your questions. And we're addressing your questions about relationships. And what we discovered is we categorized your questions in in three different categories, you know, questions that were about, you know, pre-marriage and before marriage and before relationships and how do you prepare and how do you find the right one and all that kind of stuff. So we're doing a message on that. We're doing messages on on during marriage and, and relationship and how do you keep the spark alive and how do you survive in, in marriage and, and all of that good fun stuff. And then we're doing one after. What happens after divorce, after breakup, after separation? What what about there? And so we've never taken on some of those topics, and so we're excited in this next series to take on some of those topics, and you're not going to want to miss that. That starts next Sunday. Before we get to that one, let's conclude our series seven, which part seven of seven. That was a big surprise. I know how, how long this one is going to be. Uh, but this series is about the book of Revelation. Really, it's, it's, a, it's a study in the first three chapters in the book of Revelation. And to sum it up quickly, it, the, the John, who wrote the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, he says that, that the symbolism that he's going to use as the lampstand refers to the churches, so that whenever he talks about the church, he references a lampstand, and whenever he talks about the lampstand, he's referencing the church. And this is key because the Jewish followers that, that were reading John's uh, letters and, and the book of Revelation would have understood the lampstand to be the, the front piece of furniture in, the, in Moses' temple, in the tabernacle, and as one of the only pieces of furniture. And its main job was to, to light up the showbread, and the showbread, of course, represented uh, Jesus. Jesus said in John 6 that I am the, you know, the bread of life. So Jesus called himself in reference to those who were listening to him, would have immediately you know, said, okay, well, that's the showbread in the temple. And the, the lampstand is always meant to be positioned next to the showbread. The in purpose of the lampstand is to light up and to, and to shine a light on Jesus. And when the lampstand is moved, we marginalize the light and make it harder for people to see Jesus. Can you imagine if this is, this is light, if the whole room is dark and this is light up, you would see the showbread. But the moment that I move the lampstand away and the further I move it away, the less you would see the showbread. And we as human beings have a tendency of moving the lampstand because we like to take simple things and make them complicated. And we like to say, well, you know, the church is, this is the main purpose of the church. Yeah, I know, you know, the Bible's pretty clear that the purpose of the church is to, to light up, you know, Jesus and to light up the showbread. But there's other things the church could do as well. And we could light up you know, a political party or a political agenda. And we could, we could, we should do that. We should, Christians, we should take a stand for a, a leader or for a politician or for a political party. And we should do that. And so we move the lampstand. And the more that we move the lampstand away and lighting something else up, which might be good things, but they're not God things, the more we do this, the less we see the light on and the harder it is for others to see 
Jesus. And when we move the lampstand and say, well, the church was, you know, is, is out there, we got to tell people about their sin and we got to illuminate people's sin and, and make sure that everybody knows their sin. The more we illuminate sin and move it to illuminate that, then the more we make it difficult for people to see Jesus. There's so many things that we do as, as human beings in the church and, and, and good things, but not God things. And our main job in these letters is, to, is, is a report card on the church. And, and when Jesus commends churches, he says, you're holding fast. The lampstand's holding his place. And when he says, I have this against you, he begins to talk about and illuminating something that they're illuminating something else rather than Jesus. So all of that, let's get to the last letter, and it's in Revelation chapter 3, and it starts in verse 14. It says this, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write. Now Laodicea is one, you know, one of two cities in, of the seven that is no longer exists. You can't find this city today. It ultimately uh, went away. But in this time, and in this time this letter was being written, Laodicea was an extremely wealthy, very rich city. The people so pride themselves on their financial independence that when, when an earthquake, there's lots of earthquakes in this area, apparently. Um, when an earthquake um, hit them in AD uh, 60, this Laodicea was so arrogant and so proud of their financial independence that they refused help from Rome, which became ultimately their downfall. Laodicea had a school of, of medicine as well, so it was the chief medical center of the region. One of its graduates uh, wrote a very influential textbook that lasted for hundreds of years on, on the eye. And the city was also known for its eye solve. The, the city was renowned for, also renowned for its soft raven black wool that supposedly was produced by sheep in the area that drank a certain uh, water and their wool was, ended up uh, being black, 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 black. And this wool was used to make garments for the upper class of society. And so this city, extremely wealthy, and into this, this is what Jesus writes. He said, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Now each one of these letters Jesus starts off these letters by basically giving him, you know, a, a self-identity, identifying himself to this church, an attribute of himself that would be specifically powerful to the church that he's writing to. And to this church, he says, these are the words of the amen. Again, referring to himself, Jesus referring to himself, the amen, which, you know, what does that mean? Amen simply translated means so be it. So the words of the so be it, like what does that mean? Except for 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 is a very, very, very powerful verse. And it says this, that all the promises in, in Jesus, all the promises in God are yes and amen. Which you, you read that and you and I can read that and many of us have read that, but we don't understand the meaning of this. The power of this. Because before Jesus came, before Jesus died on the cross and rose again, every religion, including Judaism, which worship, you know, God, every religion on the planet, the promises were if. In other words, if you do this, and if you don't do that, you can attain this. Every religion on the, has, uh, on the planet has ifs attached to the promises. Isn't this true? You're all looking, this is true, right? If you knock on enough doors and get enough rejections, you might get. If you do this, you might have. And if you stop doing that, you might get. Every religion has this. Yet, because of Jesus, the promises are yes. Before you even know what the question is, the promise is yes. That whatever God promised in the Old Testament, the if went away, and all of a sudden because of Jesus, not because of our goodness, not because of anything we did, the promises are yes. Come on, you got to get more excited than that. That's good. That means that I can ask God, and before you even get out what you want to ask him, he's like, yeah, yes. Yes, and so be it. Yes. Not because you're good enough, because he is. 
That's good. So to the church in Laodicea, he writes, these are the words of the amen, the so be it. The yes, the answer is always yes. The faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Jesus is the faithful and true witness because his testimony is completely trustworthy, accurate, and always reliable. Jesus is the ruler of God's creation because through his power, all things were created. He goes on, he says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am going, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. That's not good. <laughs> not to get, you know, it's like, ah. I mean, how many of you like lukewarm milk? Cold milk, yeah. Hot milk, okay. Lukewarm, bleh. I bring up milk because water, when you talk about lukewarm water, I, I, I used to use, well, I, I like cold water and I like hot water, especially if it has beans in it. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, that's, that's all great. Lukewarm water, ugh, that, that's gross. Except for, it, you know, I went to, to lunch with a friend of mine uh, from India, Dr. Jay Seelan, and at lunch he ordered a, a pot of hot water and he asked for a, a, a glass of ice water and then he asked for a, spe- a, a second cup and they brought him a second cup and he mixed the two together to where he could get it to room temperature. I was like, it, it, it actually, dis- I was like, oh, you're gonna drink that? It's just water, but I was like, ugh. Um, but, teach their own. But apparently to Jesus, he doesn't like lukewarm water. <laughs> But we, I get, we, we hear this, and there's so many messages I've heard on this. In fact, the very first message I ever preached back in Bible school, five minutes I was given terrified out of my, my boots, the very first one I preached on this scripture, this passage, lukewarm. And, and you preach on it, and God's going to spit you out of your mouth. You're either going to be on fire for Jesus or actually ice cold and all the rest of it. But that's not exactly what this means. Because if you look at the history of this, of this city, the city's major weakness was their water supply. Because the waters of the, of the Lycus uh, River that ran by the city of Laodicea was actually undrinkable. So they received water through an aqueduct built by the Romans, but by the time the cold water arrived from Colossae or the hot water from the springs of Heropolis, um, it was both were ended up being lukewarm. And so the, the weakness of the city is lukewarm water, which this is to what Jesus is writing to. Now, I find it interesting, cold water to me is refreshing, right? And, and the grace of Jesus is refreshing. Hot water is often used for purifying. And the truth of Jesus is purifying. So, so this church, what he's saying is, this church is neither grace, refreshing grace, nor purifying truth that they're somehow in, in the middle. And he says, because you've... you've found this middle ground, and you've moved the lampstand this way, I'm going to spit you out of your mouth. And then he says this. He goes on, he says, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you have, do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now the city and the church boasted of their wealth and their independence. Remember, they just recently, this is written in, you know, 80, 90, somewhere in 90 AD, 30 years before this, they had a, an earthquake that wiped out the city and they were too proud to ask for help because they were wealthy and independent and do not need a thing, even from Rome. He says, but you say you're wealthy, you've acquired wealth, you've got this, you don't need a thing, even from Rome. But Jesus called them wretched, poor, and pitiful. And what's alarming is the fact that the people of Laodicea didn't see themselves as Jesus saw them. Which is alarming for us because if they don't see them, if they didn't see themselves as Jesus saw them, is it possible for us that maybe we, Jesus doesn't see us the way we see ourselves? That we can have this false confidence like they did. And that we need to come with humility before Jesus and say, hey, we good? Everything okay here? Purify my heart, work in my heart. So this is what Jesus said. So he says, if you're lukewarm, you think you're, you're, you've got this false confidence, what do you do? So he instructs them what to do. And he says this in the next verse, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear. Remember they had black clothes was their trademark. He says, have white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful 
nakedness and salve to put in your eyes so you can see. Remember, the city was famous for its eye salve. But he says, but he, so he's speaking to them and saying, hey, the things that you have relied on, they're not so reliable. But it, you, you need to come and, and resource those same things from me spiritually. So while the city is known for its financial independence, they also made, you know, Raven Black Wolf or the upper lead, and they were also famous for eye salve. Jesus is telling him that they need the spiritual version of these things in order to realign with him, to hold on to their riches in Christ, the things that will last forever. And then he goes on and he says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. I hate that sentence. Don't you? Those whom I re rebuke, uh, those whom I love, I rebuke. How many, how many like that when you're being rebuked or disciplined? I mean, you feel, so, you feel the love. Nobody, I don't either. I'm like, I'm thinking when God rebukes or when I'm receiving rebuke or discipline, I'm not, think, I'm not feeling the love. I'm not like that. You know, the, the love me another way. But this, this sentence didn't mean that much to me until, until I began coaching football many years ago. And in coaching football, I realized that my natural trend as, as a coach was I was often harder on the kids that I saw the most potential in. That I, that the ones that I saw the most potential in, I pushed the hardest. Right, Jackson? Oh, yeah. Here's one right here. He's like, uh-huh. But and, and they're always like, they don't feel, you didn't, did you feel the love? Oh, no, yeah, no. But it, and I had many kids come to me and saying, Coach, why are you harder on me than some, anybody else? And I had to pull one aside and say, at one point, because he, he, he's, he's, you know, it's like, Coach, you're really hard on me. Why? Because I looked at him and said, I said, I've never seen more potential than someone I see in you. And it's actually a compliment. And he's like, I, it doesn't feel like a compliment. But I was like, if I, if I didn't see potential in you, it'd be a waste of my time to push you. But if I can push you, you can maybe get past your plateau here and get to the next level. Well, that's what God's looking at us. And God's saying, the ones that I love, the ones that I see potential in, the ones that, because we can feel sorry for ourselves and we can begin to make excuses when we're being disciplined. But God's saying, no, it's the potential in you that I'm trying to call out. It's if you can get through this thing, if you can push past this plateau, if you can push past that excuse, watch what I will do and what you can do. So those whom I love, rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And again, the word repent doesn't mean grovel. The word repent means turn. And he says, here am I. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Now you have to understand, when you read this verse, and you see discipline and rebuke and, and love and earnest and repentance, all the rest of it. The last thing you're feeling when you're being rebuked and you're being disciplined and, 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 and you're going through repentance and, and religious repentance, the last thing you feel and the last thing you want is relationship. But yet in the midst of all this, Jesus says, I'm standing at your door and I'm knocking. And if, any, if you open the door to me and you allow me in, I'm going to sit down and eat with you. And in the ancient world, dining together with was the ultimate symbol of friendship and relationship, which is why it was such a big deal for Jesus to invite himself to Zacchaeus' house. Because in the ancient world, that was the ultimate sign of friendship and relationship. And so what God is saying is, I want relationship. Not, not just as a ruler telling you you're wrong, but I want relationship. So open, and I'm knocking at the door, open the door to me. So he's giving a, a, an open door to this church. And then he says this, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. Again, look at the promises of God that one day we get to participate with him in his throne. And this is a perfect letter to conclude this series because the emphasis in this letter is on a lukewarm church. And how do we avoid being a lukewarm church? How do we avoid as individuals being a lukewarm Christian to where God is rejects? But how do we avoid that? Well, we have to first define what lukewarm is. 
And a lukewarm church, number one, is a church that's become complacent and lost its passion for Jesus. Much like the very first church, the church of Ephesus. Letter number one, he commended them for not moving their lampstand, but then he says, you, your, your light, your fire is not as bright as it once was. Your first love, you've walked away from this. And so when it, if, if we lose our passion and, our, and we become complacent in our relationship with Jesus, we have a tendency to slip back into lukewarmness. And we lose that fire, which is why I want to implore all of you. Listen, we got to press into worship now more than ever. Because to him who has an ear, we need to hear what Jesus is saying to the church. We got to press into worship now more than ever. You got to get into the word now more than ever. This is why, the, you know, this is why we, we're gathering together in the midst of pandemics and all the rest of it. Because it says, even as the day approaches, do not forsake the gathering together. Because there's something that happens when we gather together. In our faith, in our strength, this is not the time to shrink back. This is the time to press in. The second sign of a lukewarm church is a church that ignores the hurting and the hopeless. And this is the, the letter to Smyrna, letter number two. He, be, he commended them for, for doing good deeds and for, for helping and for, for bringing the hope into, of Jesus into their community. And a church that begins to ignore the hurting and the hopeless in the community slips back into lukewarmness. Number three, a church that is, is judgmental or is no longer concerned about holiness. A church that is more truth than it is grace and it becomes judgmental and a church that is more grace than it is truth becomes, doesn't, you know, starts losing its focus on holiness and that, that Jesus says you know, he was filled with grace and truth. It's the combination together. So we, we see letter number three. Jesus is saying this in letter, letter number four. A lukewarm church is a church that gets distracted by its methods and loses its focus on the mission. Where it becomes more about itself and about its methods and, the, and how we do church than what we do. And we can move our lampstand to go, and well, we're the best church because we do this better than anybody else. And, our, and we talk focusing on our methods and we lose our mission. A lukewarm church, number five, is a church that's more concerned about looking good than doing good. A church that is more concerned about looking good than doing good. And number six is a church that is more concerned about the needs of those inside the walls than those on the outside. So what's the solution? How do we avoid becoming lukewarm Christians and lukewarm churches? What's the solution? Well, Jesus gave us a solution in this last letter. He said, remember, he said, number one, buy for me gold refined in the fire, which meant something to this wealthy gold plush city. But what does that mean for us? Buy for me gold refined in the fire. Well, okay, that's, that's great. What does that mean? It says buy from me gold. In other words, that means that there's a source there that the later seasons had lots of physical wealth. But this is a goal that they couldn't naturally obtain. So how do you get it? Paul said this to Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, he said, Command those who are rich in this present world. He's saying, well, that excludes me. Isn't that good? I don't, I don't have to pay attention to this verse because I'm not rich. I'm not rich like. But wait a second. Did you know that if you have a household income of $30,000 or more, that you are in that you're richer than 96.1% of the people on the planet. Do you know that? Got really quiet in here, Pastor. Ruh. So I think is, this re refers to us. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth. How many know COVID, all the shaking going on, all of a sudden what we hoped in for a while is like, things, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Don't put your hope there. But instead, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And going, okay, well, that's, that's good. I'm putting my hope in God, not my, my hope in wealth. So how do I do that? He says this, command them to do good to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. So wait a second. 
You're saying don't put my hope in my bank account or my investments and, and in, in my wealth, but to put my hope in God. Okay, how do I do that? But you're saying don't put my hope in my investments so I, I give away? Yeah, why would I do that? Well, he answers that too, because he says in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So this is what the Bible says, what Paul said to Timothy, command those, this Pastor Timothy, command them. That's not, you know, encourage them, command them not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, put their hope in God and to do good, to be generous, because you're going to make an investment into your eternity and to somebody else's eternity, and that will never go away. Which is why, listen, 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 listen. How do we stay away from being a lukewarm church and stay on fire? You know how we do that? We don't just preach good, we do good. We don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. And that means that we continue to invest in my city care, not for sale, and the things in our community. And we're saying, we're not just talking Christianity. We're not just, we're not just listening and talking Christianity. We're walking the walk. And we're investing into our eternities and into somebody else's eternity. And if we do that, we can stay on fire. <laughs> Number two, he says, buy white clothes to cover your shameful nakedness. What does this mean? Well, this, this sentence that I was meditating on, this, this reminded me of a story in Genesis chapter nine where right after the flood, Noah partied. He, he had built an, a, a wooden boat for a long time and survived this thing, so he, 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 he kind of went off the rails. I love how the Bible doesn't skip any of this stuff. So he, he got like mad drunk. This is in your Bible, come on, it's, it's, it's exciting stuff, it's right there. So he gets crazy drunk to where he somehow ends up naked. This is good drunk, crazy. I don't know, I'm not sure what happened before. But anyway, he gets naked drunk, passed out, and his son Ham, poor, poor kid. <laughs> his son Ham comes and running to the rest of the family and goes, Dad, Dad smashed, and he's naked and he's drunk. And, and the other two brothers, Shem and Japheth, these poor kids, it's better than Ham though. Ham ended up being cursed by God because of this. Shem and Japheth actually take a, a blanket and they back into the cave where Noah is passed out naked and drunk and they back up and they cover him up, averting their eyes. And they, 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 they you know, cover him up, his shameful nakedness. And so we can decide, as I was reading through that story, meditating that story, I was like, we can either be a church that's like Ham, where we point out everyone's shame and nakedness and, and flaws and sins, or we can be a church like Shem and Japheth, where we, we are aware of people's sins and nakedness, but we choose to, have, to exercise love that covers a multitude of sins, and we can cover people's shame and nakedness. And so we are going to continue as a church to stay on fire and offer grace rather than judgment. The third instruction is buy eye salve. I was like, okay, what does that mean? But all of a sudden it, it started reflecting on that and I was like, it's amazing in Acts chapter nine, when Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he ended up blind, and in Acts 9, verse 18, the Bible tells us that something like scales fell from his eyes. We sing songs like Amazing Grace, I was once blind, but now I see. And as I began thinking on this, I was like, we as a church are committed to open the eyes of the blind to salvation, to the hope that is Jesus. And that every single service, without exception, we're gonna provide an opportunity for the blind to see. We're gonna provide an opportunity for people to meet Jesus. And many of you, how many of you could attest that I was once blind, I was once, I was once oblivious to the salvation that is Jesus, I was once oblivious to the hope that is God, but now all of a sudden I got spiritual, I can see. I was once blind, but now I can see. There's hands all over the room. And, and you begin to see this and say, yeah, oh, but our job as a church, by eyes off, our job is to open the eyes of the blind, and that we will be forever committed to the salvation of souls. Amen? How do we stay on fire? 
We continue not just to preach good, we do good. How do we stay on fire? We offer grace and cover shameful negatives. How do we stay on fire? We open the eyes of the blind. Today's takeaway is this. The church was intended to focus its light on one thing. Jesus. Amen? The church was intended to focus its light on one thing. Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And God, I pray that we'd listen to these messages and to this message in particular and not listen with the ears of, well, that I hope so-and-so heard that or I hope this is good for them, but listen with ears of humility for ourselves and we go, okay, God, what's in me that needs to be corrected? Where do I need to up my game, get my fire back, avoid lukewarm staleness? Lord, I pray that you'd give us insight. Holy Spirit, speak to each one of us, insight into our, ourselves. Open our eyes that we might see and keep our eyes focused on you. We commit this church and each one of our lives to you now, in Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today and you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, Maybe because you thought you had to jump through a bunch of hoops in order to begin a relationship with him. Maybe you thought you have to be good enough to be accepted by him. I don't know what your reasoning is. Maybe you're just unaware. I want you to know that while religion and us as Christians sometimes make salvation complicated, Jesus didn't make it complicated. In fact, Paul said the only the way that you can become enter salvation relationship with Jesus is if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I'm gonna lead us in a prayer that's so powerful. It's gonna confess with your mouth that Jesus is God. And if you believe that Jesus rose again from the dead and you believe what you're about to pray, right here, right now, you can begin relationship with him. It's not joining a church, not joining religion. It's a personal relationship with him. So let's pray this together. Everyone repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God. And I believe that you rose again from the dead. And I ask you right now to become my God, my Lord and Savior, and my friend. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins, for accepting me just as I am. I give my heart to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask everyone to keep their eyes closed and heads bowed. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, you just boldly raise up your hand, give me a wave and say, yeah, Pastor, I prayed this prayer the first time. I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. And at the end of the service, we'd love to give you a Bible. It's our free gift to you. It explains what this relationship's all about. I'm going to look around one more time, make sure I didn't miss anyone. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Isn't God good? Amen, amen. 